Well, let's go to God in prayer. You can stay seated, okay? Stay seated. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that you have given us. We thank you for the time of worship that we had this morning to be with you and to be with one another, to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ upon the cross and to uh, remember the sacrifice that he offered for the forgiveness of our sins. And Father, we're so thankful for that. Father, be with us now as we open up another time of worship. We pray, Father, that our hearts and minds will, will be in tune with those things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, that we may be able to offer up songs of praise and thanksgiving from our hearts, and that everything that we do this evening will glorify you. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
peaceful shore. Very deep we stand within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I.
Tonight I'm going to talk Move about it. one word, the word Lord. I found it, it's an interesting study upon the word Lord for several reasons because there's a fine line between how we use it when it's applied to people and how we use it when it's applied to God. Uh, and so we find it interesting in that way, but the idea of Lord means master. It, mean, it means one who owns somebody or something, one who's in possession of someone or something. And so that carries the idea of the understanding of, uh, of Lord. It comes from the word kuros, which means authority. So now we're dealing with authority, one who has all authority, or one who has some authority. Because Jesus Christ is Lord of what? Lords. So that tells us there's more than one Lord. But Jesus is above all those in authority. So all the masters, uh, all the kings, all the governors, all the leaders of men, they all take second place to Jesus. And that's the point when he says Lord of Lords. So the idea is, uh, as we consider Jesus' authority, uh, remember what Peter said in Acts chapter 2, uh, he was preaching about Jesus, talking about his death and his resurrection, and uh, speaking of his death and resurrection, he turns to the audience who were comprised of the Jews, and he said, let all the house of Israel know assured that this Jesus whom God raised up, has made him both Lord and Master, right? Lord and Christ. And so we look at Jesus, and there's a number of references made to the declarations concerning him. For instance, Lord would be one. God would be another. Prince of Peace would be another. Everlasting Father would be another. Son of God, Son of Man. All these different descriptors concerning who Jesus is. And yet Lord is the most often used one. And we talk about the Lord's Supper. The Supper of the Lord is the Supper of Kyriah, Lord. Supper of the one who has authority. Remember it comes from Kyriah, uh, authority. So Supper of the Kyrian would be Supper of the One who has all authority, the Lord's Supper. So uh, when we understand the meaning of that, when we look at this in a little different way then, because we're looking at the bread and we're looking at the fruit of the vine and it represents His body and His blood, but it represents One who has all authority. And we're, we're submitting to Him. And as a sovereign, as king, as uh, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, he subjugates us. We are to be subject to him. And, uh, and so that's the point of him being Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Uh, but as we consider more of this uh, idea, I want us to think about a couple of aspects concerning uh, Lord. Uh, that is, first of all, that... Uh, we find here that Jesus is Lord of Lord. So go to uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 7, if you would. Matthew chapter 7, beginning of verse 21. It's a well-known passage. You probably remember this from Bible class days when you were a child. But Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me what? Lord, he says it twice. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, Master, Master, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There's a similar passage in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. He says, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say. So in both cases, Jesus is showing us that talk is cheap. He says, if you really consider me Lord, by calling me Lord, then you will do the things your Lord 
asks you to do. It makes no sense to call someone Lord uh, and not do the things he said. That's a contradiction. And not only a contradiction, but a complete hypocrisy in the making. So if we call him Lord, he says, then you have made Jesus the Lord of your life. You have made him master of your life. You have made him the authority of your life. And you will do what he says. And so he is Lord of lords and Lord over everything. In uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible there, well, it begins in chapter 1, verse 1, that Jesus is Lord, right? Jesus is God. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And so the Word, Jesus Christ, logos, meaning one who communicates, one who uh, expresses by teaching, and so he is called the Logos, the Word. And so he is God. He was with God and is God. And then a little later in that same chapter it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, as if the glory of the only begotten Son. And so we find here that Jesus is God, and yet He's called Lord. Now that might seem no big deal, but when you talk about uh, Sarah and Abraham, Sarah called her own husband, Abraham, Lord, right? And so what was she doing? Well, she was referring to his authority as the husband, as the head of the house, and therefore calling him Lord. Uh, another time the word Lord is called Sir. I remember Dad telling me, always say Sir, man. Always say Sir, man. It's a sign of respect. Yes, sir. No, ma'am. Those are uh, interesting thoughts because they might seem a little archaic for us today, but they are, in Bible terms, references to respect for someone else. So when Jesus uh, was talking to his mother and he said, woman, in our day, in our culture, if we called mom woman, probably would have got a slap up beside the head if we called mom woman, but in those days, that was a term of respect. It was showing her that she has that authority that came from Adam, that there's someone above even the son, his mom. That meant woman. And so uh, we find here those different terms all have different meanings and they have significance. But so the word Lord is used in various ways. It's used... A title of respect. It's used as one of a master-save relationship. It's used of deity. And so that's why I said we have to, when we read these words, we have to understand the fine line that's there between how it's used with men and how it's used with deity, God. So it's important for us to understand that. Now I want to turn your attention now to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. <clears throat> We're doing this the old-fashioned way. We don't have it up on the board. I even called it the board. So, TV. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. He says, Then that, uh, Jesus answered them and said, Many good works I have shown you from my Father, for which of these works do you stone me? So he's been performing works. He's been working miracles. And uh, the things have happened right in front of their eyes. And yet they want to stone Jesus to death. And so they answered and said, the Jews answered and said to him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, Make yourself God. Jesus answered him, or them, Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom, he, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God? Now, that's a rather confusing text. But what Jesus is saying here 
is he says, I want you to go back to your Bible. Now, they were supposed to be the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. They were supposed to be the ones who knew the law. And so Jesus says, uh, go back to your Hebrew Bibles. And what does it say in your law? Notice he, the quote actually comes from Psalm 82. So when he says in your law, he's saying the entire law that's called the Old Covenant. And within the law is the book of Psalms, which is a book of poetry, really. And uh, so he's saying, what does it say in your law that God said to them, gods? He called them gods. So if God called somebody else God or gods, what is it to you that I call myself God? Or that I'm the son of God, right? He said, what, what law am I breaking? If God can say it, why can't I say it? If God can call people God, why can't I call myself God? And so they were kind of perplexed, not knowing what to say, as usual, when it came to Jesus. But let's take a look at the context and go back to John 80, uh, John 82, Psalm 82. Psalm 82. It's a really short song. Song. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah, meaning stop and pause for a moment. That's the idea of Selah. Think about it. He says, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Now go back to verse 2. He says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? These were the gods. They were the judges of the day. They were the ones who called something righteous or something sinful uh, and here, they were making some poor judgments. And so, judges were called gods. Gods of the Most High. Why? Because they had authority. And so, they had the Most High, a name attached. Actually, they were called Melchizedek. That's the name. That's the, we were talking about that in Bible class this morning, Melchizedek. His name means Most High. So they said Melchizedek, and uh, that's Most High. So God of the Most High. And so the whole idea is that God was calling these judges the gods. That is one Most High authority. They were part of the Sanhedrin. They were part of those who would make judgments that God ordained them to make. But yet they were doing it poorly because they were not showing mercy and they were showing partiality. And they were doing things they ought not to do in making certain judgments. Like everything in the life of man, things like that become corrupt. People in leadership can become corrupt if not kept in check. And so uh, it is true that all these examples that we read about kind of show us the nature of mankind. That any type of leadership... Uh, can cause some problems if there is no standard by which they live by. So again, Jesus is called God, and yet other people are called gods. And if you go back into the book of Genesis, you'll also find that there were other gods, many other gods. 
So here's yet another word that we need to understand how it's used. Many words have different various meanings. So God can mean deity. God can refer to the Father, right? Jesus uh, referred to the Father as God. And yet Jesus was himself God. So depending on the context, you'll determine the meaning. So there were gods, as in idols that the lands and the people worship, and yet there was one God over all those gods, just as there are many lords in the world at the time, and yet there was only one Lord, Lord above all. Another point, <coughs> as we consider this, is, uh, uh, well, I don't want to take too much time on that. Uh, point number two is Jesus is Lord of all men, all men, all people. And whether they know it or not, there's so many people living today that don't understand, even atheists, they don't understand because they're not willing to, but they're under the authority of God. And so everyone is under the authority of God's word. We're all going to be judged by the word that Christ gave. In fact, he said, the word that I spoke in the same will judge you in the last day. Therefore, his word is going to judge mankind. And so everyone falls under the authority of God's word, whether they want to or not, or whether they know it or not. And the same thing applies to God's authority. Everyone is under his authority, whether they want to or not, or whether they know it or not. And so therein lies that God is above all, and he is certainly uh, above all men. Go to Acts chapter 10. This is the story, or the account, more accurately, the, the account of the, the conversion of Cornelius. But in Acts chapter 10, uh, beginning of verse, uh, if I can get to it, <clears throat> verse 34, Peter says, <clears throat> Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no, put no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God said to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. Lord of all. And, uh, and so uh, we find that later that Paul says the same thing concerning the Gentiles. He said, He is not only Lord over the Jews, but He is Lord over the Gentiles. Meaning the same thing. He's Lord over all. Whether they know it or not, or whether they want to believe it or not. And then uh, we understand uh, also in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. He says, For there is uh, no distinction between Jew and Gentile, or Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so uh, we find that language here uh, as it relates to, to everyone, to both Jew and to Gentile, that it's necessary for both <coughs> Jew and Gentile to call upon the name of the Lord. And we talked about that phrase some time ago, what it means to be calling on the name of the Lord. But I think it's really easy to discern uh, here, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, calling on the name of the Lord puts the authority of Christ in perspective. It makes him Lord of all. Because he's the Lord to which we are to turn for salvation. Remember, it's, there is no name uh, in which salvation can be found except the name of Jesus. So, uh, here we find that Jesus is the only way to the Father. But in Acts chapter 2, it says, It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he preaches Christ. And then he tells them that they crucified Christ. They murdered Christ in verse 36. And then they respond 
saying uh, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Meaning, we killed, we realized that we murdered Christ. What are we to do now? Are we condemned to hell now? Is there any help for us? What can we do? And what was Peter's reply? <coughs> Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Now, that gets back to the idea of what verse 21 said. Calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord. It has everything to do, not with pray, not with praying, not with prayer, as some like to contend. A lot of people say, again, if you say this prayer... Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. If you said that prayer, you're saved. But where can you find that in the Bible? They'll take this verse and run with it, of course. But that's not what it means, and that's not what it says. But anyhow, if calling on God means you're calling on God to hold himself to his promises. In other words, if you do this, then you will get this. I promise. Calling on God means calling on His promise. To hold Him to His promise. In other words, I've done what you said. Now, please God, hold to your promise to me to save me. That's what that means. It's not a prayer. And we do that. How? Well, we're going to come back to Acts chapter 2. But 1 Peter chapter 3 kind of really tells us what that means in a different way. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning of verse 21, he says, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. All right, did you get that? There's an antitype. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a form, there's a pattern that saves us. And that pattern, that antitype, uh, points to the real deal. But he says, that pattern saves us. What's that pattern? Baptism. He says, baptism now saves us. But notice the parentheses. He says, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not about taking a bath. Okay? It's not about getting clean that way. It's a spiritual bath, if you will. And he says, so it's not about the removal of the, the dirt from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Or some translations say uh, an answer of a good conscience or an inquiry of a new conscience or an appeal for a good conscience. So that's the idea of calling upon the name of the Lord. And it includes baptism. Now go back to Acts chapter 2. So, Acts chapter 2, verse 21 says, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 shows us explicitly what they did in calling on the name of the Lord, <coughs> holding God to his promise. What did, they, what did Peter do? He promised forgiveness of sins. Right? Repent. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. There, there it is. That's the promise. If you get baptized, if you repent of your sins, and you get baptized, your sins will be forgiven. They're calling on the name of the Lord. Now go to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Paul makes reference to this in chapter 9, but also here in chapter 22 in more full detail. But in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, he's given a uh, recounting his conversion to Christ and how Ananias was to teach him uh, about Jesus Christ and that he, he was going to be saved from what the, the preaching of Ananias was. So now, Ananias has been preaching to him. And now look at verse 16. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. And what? Wash away your sins. And what? Calling on the name of the Lord. 
In other words, do what God said do and hold him to his promise. That's calling on the name of the Lord. So, you're calling on God's promise to save when you do what he says to be saved. That's the idea. And what that does, it shows us the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, this all hinges back to what he said in Acts chapter 2. So let's go back to Acts chapter 2. It's rather tedious, but we go back to Acts chapter 2, we understand what he's saying. In verse 32, he says, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. No one there could deny what happened to Jesus Christ. What happened to Jesus of Nazareth? He was nailed to the cross. The Jews in Jerusalem saw it. And he says, you're all witnesses. You all saw it. Verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord. In other words, long before this all happened, the Father said to Jesus. In other words, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So what this means as the rest of the New Testament unfolds is the fact that Christ was elevated to a position of authority. That he was given a place of honor. He was crowned with glory. And then he was marked out as king of kings. Lord of lords. He was reigning. That's what this means. Reigning supreme. And that's why he said to the apostles, uh, before he ascended back to the Father, he said, all authority, notice that, all authority has been given unto me under heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we have that, and it's by His authority. And when we respond in the manner in which these folks responded to the remedy for sin, which was repent and be baptized, we're making Jesus Christ Lord. He's sitting on his throne. We're, we're acknowledging his authority. By acknowledging his authority, you're saying, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are my Messiah. You are everything. All those names that we could go through and find out who he is. But he is the one who has supreme authority based upon your obedience. You're acknowledging his authority. That's why when he says the Lord, God, the Father, said to my Lord, the Son, Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, we understand the title Lord means much more when it's applied to Jesus Christ. Him having all authority under heaven and earth. Uh, in John 13 and verse 13, uh, Jesus was saying, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for I am. I am both teacher and Lord. And, uh, and so he says, I am. If there's any doubt about what Jesus was talking about, what he was saying was, I'm not only the Son of God, I'm not only the Son of Man, I am the Lord. And when he says the Lord, what's he saying? He's saying, I am God. Because the Father said, He's the Lord. And by saying, He was the Lord, that's why they wanted to stone Him. Because they said, that's blasphemy. But Jesus said again, he goes back and he says, well, wait a minute. Think about this. Go back to your Bible. Go back to Psalm 82 and you're going to find that God himself called other people gods. So what's the big deal if I call myself God and Lord of all? And of course, seven times Jesus said, I am. That was another motive for the Jews to stone him to death for blasphemy because only 
I am belong to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet Jesus said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. It's a ever, that's the title or the name for God. God is the name for the Godhead. God is the name for divine nature. God is the name for divinity. God is the name for Trinity. All right? It means the ex ever existing one. I am God. And, uh, and so God is a name for the Godhead or divinity. Of which there's one divinity. There's, one, there's only one divine nature. And it's called God. So if there's only one divine nature and it's called God, there's only one God. But yet there's three people that comprise that one divine nature called God. So Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord. That is exactly what Jesus said when he says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. We're one and the same. You can't have one without the other. And so he came to show who the Father is. But uh, there's more to say about this. Maybe we'll get back to this next time. Uh, if you have any questions, by the way, that you want to submit, uh, submit them to me. We'll get to those at some point. But the point tonight is to show us that the meaning of Lord uh, has the different uh, nuances of meaning especially when it's applied to men. And it does mean master, but it means master with authority. When applied to Jesus, it means supreme authority. And when we do what this supreme authority asks us to do, we're enthroning him on his throne. We're making him king of our lives and lord of our lives, and we're acknowledging him and his authority. Anything less, anything less than that, we do a disservice to Jesus and to his state of ruling and reigning now in the throne of heaven at the right hand of the Father. So, I guess the only way for us to begin to make him Lord of our lives is to do what he says. And it begins by what Jesus said to do initially. And he says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He could take that again. That's calling on the name of the Lord. That's a fact that he gave, but it's also a promise. He says, if you do this, you will be saved. Now, do you want to do that? That's the question. And so you call upon the name of the Lord. You're saying, I'm going to hold you to your promise. I'm going to do what you said, and you will be king of my life. Some of you have done that. Perhaps some of you have done that and have not continue to make him Lord of your life. And so he says, all you need to do is repent. Come back, change your mind about who Jesus is and about your subjugating yourself to him. Remember, as I said before, we've always got someone we want to make king of our lives uh, when it comes to this life. We want sometimes it's, it's things, it's material possessions, it's, it's uh, sex, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's rock and roll, it's all this stuff that's out there that people make idols of, make gods of, make lords of, make idols of. And yet Jesus says, continue to make me Lord of your life. He understands that we're going to make other things Lord of our lives along the way at times because we are human beings and we make the wrong decisions. But that's what repentance is about. And repentance means I messed up. I admit I messed up and I want to return to you as my king. That's what that means. If you're subject to that invitation tonight, why don't you come forward now as together we stand and sing.
Heavenly Father, thank you to you for allowing us to be here this evening service. We're thankful for the talents of the folks that are leading our worship services today. We ask you, Father, to help us to apply all these things to everyday lives and make better disciples for you. Be with us as we leave here tonight. Protect us on our way home. Bring us back next point in time. We pray in Jesus' name.